I'm going to go all in maybe later. I am committed to being non-committal. That's the easy way to do it, right? How many of us have gotten caught in a pattern before where we've gone, eh, I'll do it later? I think, of, I think of comedian Ken Davis when he says in his show, there, there was a the video that he did where he said, you know, here, you guys, you guys came to the 7 o'clock show. You were okay with coming to the late show, but he goes, the reason you were okay with coming to the late show is because when the tickets went on sale, you looked and saw there was a 5 o'clock and a 7 o'clock. And you thought, oh, well, 5 o'clock, then I get home and have a nice, I can have a nice dinner with my family and everything. But see, you didn't buy the tickets. And by the time you got to being able to buy the tickets, the 5 o'clock was showed out, so you bought the 7 o'clock. See, you're procrastinators and you're my kind of people. We have to get past the idea of maybe later. Now, last week, we talked about the ultimate concept of all in, where it starts with the source. And we, we, we gave a nice little illustration to this when we talked about the idea of poker and No Limit Texas Hold'em. And I get a huge fan. I love playing it. I really do. It takes strategy. And honestly, any, any real player in that, do you play your cards or do you play the person across the table? Oh, Steve, come on, man. You're killing me, Smalls. Ultimately, ultimately, you end up probably playing the person across the table, sometimes when the hand's just really good. We talked about the fact that there are a, a set of power hands. Like, it, it starts with the pair, it goes all the way up to the royal flush, and we talked about how the royal flush is ultimately what God is holding. And if we're all in with him, if we're all in with the source, we have a never-ending victorious royal flush. It's always there. And, and we gave a reminder. One of the reminders was this. And if you didn't get one of these last week, you could pick one up and buy the doors on the way out. It's got our logo on one side, and on the other side, it says all in. So if you want a reminder of this, I would love for you guys, if you didn't take one of these, take one of these and have it with you. It's a great reminder of reminding us to be all in. Now, there was a reminder question, too, something that I said I wanted us to keep on our hearts and our minds during the entire two weeks of this, and that was this. Are you truly willing to fight to do whatever it takes to go all in? And this is that concept of all in, both with poker and with life, is that it's a push for everything. It's putting it all on the line, and it's giving over the control to another source, it's allowing another source to control what's going to happen when you push everything out there. And we talked about in, 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 in conjunction with this, Mary and Martha. When Jesus came to the house, see, Mary went and she immediately sat at his feet. Martha was busy with all the details. Got to get the food ready. Got to make sure everything's clean. Got to make sure everything's nicely taken care of because people are here. She was dead set on the hospitality aspect. She got upset and she looked at Jesus and she said, tell my sister to help me. And Jesus looked at her and said, oh, Martha, you got it wrong. See, Mary has discovered the source and it will not be taken from her. And that source, 2 Corinthians 12, 9, as Paul tells us that his power is made perfect in our weakness. And then there was purpose, Romans 12, 1 and 2, that we are a living sacrifice for God, that we work toward a transformed mind, the renewing of our minds. And then the meaning that comes from it, Philippians 3, that we share in his suffering and that it is not of our own power. It is through our perseverance in Christ, as James says in this first chapter of his book, that when perseverance has taken its full effect, we will be complete and lacking in nothing. We said that we must let go in all things to be all in. And how do we do this? We do this by following the greatest commandment in Matthew 22. Jesus said, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's how we do it. We got to have desperation for God. We got to have desperation for God to move. And we have to allow it to be his movement and not bent on our own desires. Now, the source gives us purpose, gives us meaning. Our desperation allows us to let go and to be all in. Then it begins to overflow into every area of our lives. 
So the question is, what is that overflow? And that's what I want to get to today, is the action-oriented part of what happens when we go all in with the source. I got four principles for you this morning of an all-in heart that overflows because of that source. It's humility, thankfulness, generosity, and servanthood. So let's start with number one, humility. The overflow of all in from the source, that has to mean that we lay down our pride. We cannot hold on to our pride. We talked last week about the fact that we had to lay out everything. Like I said, let go in all things. One of the hardest things for any of us to let go of and to lay down is our pride. That is absolute truth. And anybody that's going to deny that, we'll have a conversation later. And I'll be the first one to admit to you, I fail every day. Every day. This is one of the most difficult things to lay down, but we have to lay down our pride. We have to find some level of humility. And we have to conduct ourselves in a manner that ends up putting others before ourselves. Romans 12, 3 through 5. For by the grace given to me, I say, everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Why is this? For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. We don't think of ourselves first or think of ourselves better because we are one body. We work together. That's God's design. Why do we work together? Because we have a common enemy. That enemy doesn't want us to lay down our pride. That enemy doesn't want us to let go in all things. We work together. We each have our own functions. We each have our own gifts. We each have our own passions. And we function in that capacity, but we do it together. If we think we're better, we're not functioning the way that God intended. But if we learn to function correctly, we see this happening. Philippians 2, 1 through 4. So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, Paul says, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. If there are any of those things, we function together. Laying down our pride, living in humility, looking to serve others before we serve ourselves. Now, you don't want to neglect yourself, okay? That's the funny thing here. You don't want to neglect yourself, but if you seek to put others first, somehow that usually comes back around. It's funny how that works. And I had a journal entry. I had to mention this. One year ago, I had a journal entry. A little over a year ago, not a year, sorry, 10 years ago. Over 10 years ago, my 27-year-old self wrote this in the first entry in the journal that I'm in right now. Yes, 10 years. I know that seems like a lot for one journal. I'm not always writing stuff down. <laughs> but 10 years ago in the first entry, I wrote something to this effect, and this hit me. I went back and I was reviewing this, knowing that I'm getting to the end of this journal, I went back to the beginning to see where it started. And it was like a slap in the face. Because in it, it said, it had a thing, it said, you want a happy heart? Consider serving others before you serve yourself. Wow. That was a slap in the face right then and there. Thinking that 10 years ago, I wrote that down. It's funny how when we go and review things, how much it can apply in the present. Ultimately, if we're going to function properly in humility, in the overflow, forgive my Dr. Seuss moment, it has to continue to start at the source, of course. <laughs> so the source is this, James 4.10. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. 
A true heart of humility, hear this, a true heart of humility, it bends the knee first and foremost at the cross. It bends the knee first and foremost at the cross, and it does not rise under its own power, but only when lifted by the source. And that is the kind of heart humility that is needed for the all-in to overflow. Point two, thankfulness. A thankful heart is a happy heart. That old saying, a thankful heart is a happy heart. To get that all-in thankfulness, we first have to remember our need to let go of all of those things. So we're going to go back to that principle here for a second. Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. This is a release for us. This is an opportunity to stop carrying all of those burdens that hold us down that allow us to keep hanging on to all of those things. This is the release, the part of letting go and how we live. Dave talked about this when we were in the with and without series, okay? Letting go with thanksgiving to the source. What's that bring? Peace. It even says it right there. It says, the peace that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds. Peace that surpasses all understanding. We're not even going to get it. It's just going to be there. Learning this process of letting go through thanks, it's what provides us contentment. It's a difficult word for a lot of us. But we should take this command and put it to action. That contentment that comes to us, let's put it to action. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. That's pretty much straightforward. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances. But that's the big one. In all circumstances. Not just when it's happy, not just when things are blessed, not when things are going well. No, 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 no. Give thanks in all circumstances. That whole count it pure joy, my brothers, when you face trials of many kinds. Hey, James, I got something to say about that. It's difficult. It's difficult in all circumstances. We struggle continually to give thanks in all circumstances. How hard is it, how hard is it to give thanks when everything's going good. Pretty easy. When you're deep in a pit, struggling in everything in life, is it easy to give thanks? You got to remind ourselves, I'm still breathing. Consider others who learned this. And these examples are insane. And that's just it. Some of the stuff that some of these people in Scripture went through for the sake of Jesus makes me feel pretty low when I complain about things. Paul. Man, I just keep coming back to this guy. It's hard, though, when he wrote pretty much three-fourths of the New Testament. Philippians 4, 11 through 13. Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. In every situation, I've learned to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. And something a lot of us know, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. See, Paul's going, I go to the source. And if I'm all in with the source, I can give thanks in all circumstances. How about David. Thanks is littered throughout the Psalms. It's littered throughout the Psalms. And no matter what his plight or situation, he always seemed to find a way to give thanks to God. And I'll tell you what, there are times when this just cracks me up. I love the way David is so blunt. He's so forward. He's so in tune with God. Man, this guy prayed dangerously. And it's awesome. But how funny is it at times when, when he was down, when he was low, when he was struggling with this stuff, he gets on his knees and he says, God, this is terrible. You're my only refuge. I need you. Hey, knock back my enemies. Destroy them. Rip them limb from limb. Kill them. Get rid of them. Oh, and by the way, thanks. Wow. Wow. 
I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't know what God would do if you, if you went to prayer like that these days. Ultimately, I think, I think we're in a position where, like David, though, we get on our knees. And when we pray, we pray dangerously. But rather than destroy my enemies, I think it's turned into, God, open my heart to love my enemies. I'm not saying David was wrong, but when Jesus established a new covenant, he said, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Reach out to them. Enfold them. Show them who you are in me. That's part of the all in. So even even in those utterly difficult times in dealing with those situations, it's a never-ending process of thanks for what we're going through. Lastly, how about Job? The guy literally had everything stripped from him to where he had nothing left. And his friends kept telling him, just curse God and give it over with. And Job said, no, I'm still breathing. I I don't don't know if I could do that. I know in a lot less difficulty, in a lot less heartache, I've, I've had my conversations with God. A truly thankful heart will and should overflow to the source. I mean, after all, he's the reason that we have all we need, right? And it's why we use that overflow and our all-in to work into the third principle of generosity. Ooh, here we go. Touchy subject. Generosity. Touchy subject, most people. And based on my experiences, I'm, I'm going to be honest, based on my personal experiences, I'm not afraid to address this. I'm not. The Word of God's clear on this subject, and we all know arguing with God is pointless. And honestly, when we think generosity, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Money. Money. And, yeah, we instantly think of this, and it does invoke that to a point. It always will. And and I want to look at that just a little bit, but there's, there's a secondary reason to this. It's not to sit here and say, oh, my gosh, you have to give up your money. No, I want you to look at a specific concept here. Malachi 3.10. Bring the full tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. Anybody notice anything interesting about that? I don't know anywhere else in Scripture where God says, put me to the test. Put me to the test. But here, when it comes to our provision for living, when it comes to everything that we need to survive in this life, God says, put me to the test. Obey what I've asked and test me on this. See what happens. Now, I have a friend, and I asked permission to use this. I have a friend, and I want to tell you, this friend came to me and said, hey, you know, I I just want to ask your opinion on this. Recently, I was getting ready to write my tithe check, and and I just felt God say, hey, I want you to get rid of debt. And he goes, but I'm not sure that that was was directly God speaking, or if if I'm just thinking, oh, I'd rather put all this extra money toward getting rid of this debt so then I can do more. And I, I, I told him this. I said, I'm, I'm not going to give you the typical pastoral answer. I'm not going to sit here and tell you, oh, no, absolutely not. You need to get that tithe. Don't don't even think twice. God would not tell you not to do that. No, it's not true. I've been in situations like that. Many people have. And he asked me, okay, what do you think then? I said, do this. He said, it's the only thing God says put me to the test on. So he said, take three months. Challenge yourself for three months to keep pouring yourself into both your tithe and the debt. I said, at the end of the three months, you don't feel like you're in a good position, the debt's getting paid down, and God is taking care of you in better ways. I said, then take three months and flip-flop it. Take three months, throw all that extra money toward the debt, and get some of that paid down so that it's taken care of. Because I said, I know, God doesn't want us in debt either. 
I said, that's fine. I said, because if that's what you're hearing, I said, test God first, because the first thing he says in his word is test me on this. And it wasn't but a month later that I, I get a text message from this friend. And this was his follow-up thought. He said, you know, my tithe was kind of the start where I am now. <laughs> and now all of a sudden, we're doing more with less. And then like a couple weeks after that, I get another text message from him that says, ha ha, this is hilarious. My wife just got a bonus that she's never gotten before. I'm not saying God's always going to return us constant money when we're faithful. But man, oh man. He says, test me on this and see what happens. Listen to what he says in Matthew chapter 6, 25 to 34. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. It's not life more than food and the body more than clothing. Look at the birds of the air. They never so, neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? Oh, you of little faith. Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added to you. If we are in with all things, letting go of all things to be all in. With the source, seek first the kingdom of God, and what? All things will be added. So what's the point here? Paul gives us a great answer, 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 8. The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has made up his mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. God will provide the opportunities. God will provide the resources. When you think you can't do anything, do it anyway and see what happens. It's not a matter of whether or not you can be that person that drops a huge amount of money to something or can give insane amounts of hours to anything. That's not what it's about. See, God's saying, let everyone do what he can. And not out of obligation. No, you do it out of joy and out of service to the source because you want to be all in. There are opportunities everywhere. You just have to seize them. Notice here, though, money's not a specific mention. Though we do have commandments from God on how that works, it's far greater than material aspect. So even though that's in there, even though we've addressed it, even though specifically we've talked about God saying, test me. And we got a great example of somebody that tested the process. The thing is, is that the all-in overflow of generosity, it doesn't flow from the wallet. It flows from the heart. Galatians 6, 2. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. The law of Christ, Matthew 22. Love God, love people. Our overflow of generosity, there's another definition for that. Sacrifice. And we were there last week. Again, Romans 12, 1 and 2. Offer yourselves as a living sacrifice, the renewing of your mind. Like David said, create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Going all in. So the overflow of generosity, 
The overflow of generosity that flows from the heart is loving God and loving people. That translates into principle four, being a servant. A heart that serves. Our all-in starts with the source, and we serve that source. And that's how we create that overflow. Again, we see it come full circle. Anybody else notice that? We always keep coming back to it starts with the source. It's involved with the source. It's being all in with the source. We choose the servant heart, or we should choose the servant heart, because that is exactly who our source is. Mark 10, 45. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many We overflow in service to others, not out of the obligation or responsibility, but because we are all in with the source. And that source presented us with, albeit an unreachable and very unattainable, yet perfect example of the servant heart. To give his life as a ransom for many. It's a never-ending process. We are always molded. He's the potter, we're the clay. But when we release and allow him to form and we push all in, we're pushing with the winning hand. It's a never-ending royal flush. And when we're all in, serving others, serving others will produce humility. It will produce thankfulness. It will produce generosity. The band's going to come back on stage. And as they do, I want you to give a takeaway concept for today. So don't miss this. Whether you're going to write this down, whether you're going to screenshot it, whatever. It flows in conjunction with exactly where we came from last week. We talked about how we are letting go of all things to be all in. And that we need that desperation for God. So how does that work into the overflow? It means this. All in with the source means our all-in will overflow to every area of our lives. Colossians 3.17, And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Anybody else see how it all just got summed up for us? Just like that. There it is. It's all summed up in one verse. Whatever you do in word or deed, this is being a servant and being generous. Do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. Humble yourselves before the Lord. Giving thanks to God the Father through him. Thankful. Are you truly willing to fight to do whatever it takes to go all in? Can you, without hesitation, say no matter what comes, no matter what life brings, no matter what I'm feeling, thinking, doing, saying, I will be all in and declare it. Yes, I will. I don't care about the situation in life I'm in. I don't care about where God has me. I don't care about what I'm struggling with or what I'm blessed with. I am going to rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and give thanks in all circumstances Why? Because whatever I do in word or deed, I am going to do all for the glory of God. And I'm going to give thanks for it. I'm going to be all in. And when I'm all in with the source, when I'm all in with the source, it's going to overflow. And I'm going to love God. And I'm going to love people. Let's sing. We have to let go of all things in order to be all in. We need desperation for God, desperation for God to move, and for it to be his movement and not our own desires. And then all in with the source. When we're there, when we're at that point, when we have given it up and we are all in with the source, that all in will overflow into all the areas of our lives. Let's pray.
Father God, I pray this morning that as we move on and move out of this place once again after being together, that we declare in one voice as one body that you say we are, yes, I will. No matter what the circumstances in life, no matter what we may be dealing with, in the high and the low, Father, we say, yes, I'm all in. And I will continue to fight with you, the source, to do whatever it takes to stay in that place. And Jesus, that, that is the honor and the glory. Whatever we do in word or deed, all for your glory. I pray, Jesus, that you bring a strength, a foundation, a realization and an understanding to us that will garner more wisdom as we move forward, that with each step we take, every six inches that we move, Jesus, your truth abounds in love. That we speak by the authority we have been given in you. Father, help us sell out to the all-in. Pushing everything in, knowing you got this. Our royal flush, you are victorious. We love you, Jesus. Be our guide. Be our protection. Be our all-in. In your name we pray.